it looks like we are live. Everything is working as expected. So today's topic is going to be on, as you can see right here, the shell and the terminal. And we also need to talk a little bit about files and folders. So I, I'm going to show you, I think I'm going to first start off with showing you that because I think a lot of people don't actually yet have a really solid understanding of how files and folders work on the computer. So, oh, whoops, I was typing in stuff over there. I didn't mean to be typing. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller and we're going to bring over a finder window. So we can just bring this over here real quick. And I'm going to resize this. Whoops. And we're going to create a test directory. So I got a temp folder here. It's probably got some good stuff in it. The first thing I'm going to do <clears throat> is I'm going to make a new folder. And I'm going to do that with a command called mkdir which stands for make directory. You'll hear the terms directory and folder used interchangeably. There was a technical difference between the two at one point in time, but it's very nuanced and not super relevant. So when you hear folder and directory, you can assume they're the same thing. One of the things that you need to know about the terminal is there's a special character, which is right below the escape key called the tilde and it represents your home directory. So actually, before I even do this, I'm gonna take a step back. This is, oh, by the way, I talked yesterday about taking notes. Please, please, please do go to gist.github.com. I'm gonna pull this over here so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Go to gist.github.com and you should have hopefully a file called something like beyondcodenotes.md, and we're going to get into what Markdown is later. But go ahead and continue your notes here and make sure to save a couple of times during the, our, our time together tonight because this doesn't autosave. That's one of the failings of it. But just is a great place to take your notes. So first command is PWD. PWD stands for Print Working Directory, and it it prints where you are in the terminal. So to give you an analogy, down here, this is essentially the PWD of Finder. This little status bar, which I don't know if I can make this much bigger for you to see it well, but it's got the path Macintosh HD users AJ temp. This is the working directory I am at in Finder. And the working directory that I'm at in the terminal is, oh, by the way, if you've got any comments or questions, please ask on YouTube. That's where I'm trying to keep track of them, just so you know. And let me go check on that real quick, see what we've got. Sorry for the delay. Okay, just making sure we don't have any comments or questions so far. So print working directory, it shows you where you are. So right now I'm in my home folder. Tilde is also my home folder. So I'm going to make a directory, tilde slash, and I've already made a directory. Oops, actually I'm going to do dash P, which means that if I want to make more than one directory at a time, I can. And that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to do tilde slash temp, that already exists, and I'm going to do beyond code demo and there is a reason that I didn't use spaces <clears throat> that's because of the way that the shell works which we'll go into a little later so now you can see I created that directory and now it exists right here so if I go into that directory by double clicking on it in finder my working directory changes down in the status bar and I'm going to make yet another directory we're going to call this dir1 and you can see it appeared there. So the same, and if I were to make a directory here from Finder, if I were to list that directory, so I'm gonna type LL for list, and I'm gonna copy and paste this directory, and you can see that there 
is, well, LL is list in table format. I'm gonna go back and list this not in table format just because my screen is a little too big to show the table well. You can see here's dir1, here's dir2. And in my case, I've got a nice little folder icon. So these commands are how we work with files in the terminal. And we're gonna go over some more of them. If I want to create a file yesterday, we used echo to create a file. So I'm gonna do that again today. I'm gonna to do echo, hello world. I'm putting single quotes around this because otherwise it won't work. And we'll go into that a little later on. But I'm gonna create a file. I'm gonna copy and paste this directory here. And I'm gonna call this readme.md. And then we're gonna see that indeed the file appears in Finder as well. Now in the terminal, I don't always wanna be using long directory paths. So I'm going to use the command push D, which pushes into a directory. So I'll go ahead and paste there. Now I've got a shorthand version of what my directory looks like. And if I do PWD for print working directory, we can see that now where I am in the terminal is the same place that I'm at in Finder. So my working directory in Finder is here in the status bar. My working directory here in terminal, I just printed out and I've got a little shorthand version right here. So push D and pop D are how we move in and out of directories. So I can push D down into dir1 and now if I print working directory, you can see that I am in dir1. That's the same as me double clicking and going in here. Now, if I were to click the back button, when I, when I had double clicked, that's the same as me doing push D. It pushes me into the directory. And when I click the back button, it pops me out of the directory. Likewise, if I do pop D, it pops me out of that directory and then I can use PWD and I can see where I am again. Now, when you're just searching random blogs and forums, almost everything will show using CD. Don't use that, don't bother. In modern shells, CD and push D are the same, but if you're ever writing a script, they're likely to be different and the behavior of push D is pretty much guaranteed to always behave correctly whereas CD doesn't always do what we want it to do. And we can get into that more later, but just because you've probably already come across that, and if you haven't, you will soon. I wanted to make sure that you're aware that it's not the right thing to use most of the time. In fact, I don't know of any case where it is the right thing to do. So, so far we've got PWD, we've got MKDIR-P, we've got LL and LS for, uh, LS for list, LL for list and table format. And we have push D and pop D. So you should have a note for all of those. Now the next thing, and echo, we also talked about echo. So let me go back up to that. By the way, if you use the arrow keys up and down, that's how you go through your history. And this is true in just about any shell. So bash is a shell. That's what we always script in bash and just about every tutorial that you come across online is going to be for bash. So bash is relevant to learn for scripting in particular. Fish is something that we use. That's why I have these nice colors and when I start typing something, it starts auto-completing. Fish is more for when you wanna interact with the terminal. Bash is for when you wanna script in the terminal. And the commands are the same. So both fish and bash, I can access all of the same commands, but the way that it's colored, the way that autocomplete works, and then the way that scripting works is different. So for most of what you do when you are in a terminal, you want to be using a shell like fish, precisely fish. But whenever you're scripting, you want to be using bash. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense right now, but it will as we move forward through time. I'm just gonna check uh, comments real quick on YouTube, see if we've got anything. Chat should be enabled. Chat should also be enabled on 
Facebook. I'm taking a look at both of those. And all right, I'll just go ahead and move on. So another command that I use all the time is rm, which is remove. So if I want to get rid of that file that I just created, I'm going to type the letter R, capital R, caps and lowercase, make a difference in the terminal and in most things in programming. You need to keep that in mind. Almost always caps and lowercase are different. So I'm going to use, I'm typing in the uppercase R, and as you can see here, there's only one file that begins with an uppercase R. So if I hit tab, tab is the autocomplete key in the terminal. If I hit tab, it fills it out. So you're familiar with autocomplete from a browser. If you are using your browser, let me see if I can pull my browser back up here, just for demonstration. Let me pull that back on over. All right. So, oh no, the title is wrong on this. Oops, my bad. <laughs> We're not talking about setting up your first server. We're talking about bash. So you go up in your bar and you start typing something out, say Sonic the Hedgehog. It's going to pull from your search history or from auto suggestions or from, let's see, we got search history, we got auto suggestions and we have browsing history is what it's likely going to pull from. Same thing is happening in the terminal, as you've seen happen with what I've been doing. So now, after I've deleted that file, if I type rm again, well, it's not giving me that result because that file's deleted. I'm going to go ahead and recreate that file just by using echo to put the contents hello world into the file. Now, if I type rm, because the file exists again, it's going to search through my history and it's going to see, well, and I didn't even type M yet. It's going to say, what is it that you're likely to do? And it sees that I am likely to remove README because I've done that before. And so it's highlighting it. So if I push tab at this point without doing anything else. Oh, it did. Oh, sorry. If I push the right arrow at this point, because it's showing me a suggestion that's already auto-completed, I hit the right arrow to accept it, it goes to the end of the line, I can repeat that action. So I've got up and down, and then I have start to type a couple of letters, and then I can hit arrow to accept what it's prompting me that I'm likely to want to type for my history. So that's another command that's really useful when we're working on a server. And again, I'm sorry for the title, I, I forgot to update the title before I did the live stream. So this is actually, we're doing the lesson on Bash today, not how to set up the server. We did that yesterday. You can check in the description for the links to that if you want to check that out. So one more command that is really common to use is rip grep. There's, there's two commands. One is called grep and the other is called rip grep. And grep is very old and that's what you'll see in most tutorials. Rip grep is very modern and it works better with code. So that's what I like to use. Now rip grep, where did my browser window go? Did I close that out? Silly me. The easiest way to install it is going to be to go to webinstall.dev slash rg. And there you've got a command that you can copy and paste. If you're on Windows, the command is slightly different. The Windows button should be selected automatically on Windows. If not, you click it. So I go back here. I'm going to install this. And it's telling me it's already installed. Nothing to worry about. You might get a prompt that you need to run an extra command or close and open your terminal. So if you get that, you'll do that. So this, what it allows me to do, and I need to be... I need to have some files that are worth searching. So I'm going to go back in my history by hitting up. I'm going to create this hello world file again. And now I'm going to type RG and LL. And what you can see is it's actually going to search all files inside of the directory that I am presently in, that I'm presently in other than some temporary files and certain cache files 
and the sorts of things that we're not likely to intend to search. And it's going to print out where it finds that match. And like most things, this is case sensitive. So if I do hello, I don't get back any results. But if I do hello with a capital H, I do get back results. And we can change this behavior by using dash I. And grep is very similar to this. Modern versions of grep will have nearly identical behavior, but because different systems are configured differently and because rip grep is so much better, I teach you using RG instead. So dash I allows it to be case insensitive, so now I get a match on hello. So that's how we search through files and folders. There's another command. Once you've installed something from Webby, you also get a command that is Webby. So now I'm going to install FD as well. And if I use that, FD is short for find, and it will give me a list of all files and folders that it can find. So I'm going to create another file, and I'm going to create it in dir1, same thing, and in dir2. And then I'm going to do my search, and you can see it prints out a list of all the files that it can find. And this has a lot of interesting options to be able to match on names and stuff like that. If we want to be able to search at the same time that we are listing all the files and folders, there's another command. So I'm going to type webby fzf, take note of this as well. fzf is another great command that will allow us to fuzzy find. That's what fzf. So if I hit enter, in this case, the list is so short that it doesn't do that much interesting. But I can start typing the name of a file, like readme, and fuzzy find will allow, it's what we call smart case. So as long as I'm typing in lowercase, it'll search uppercase or lowercase. But if I start doing uppercase, then it becomes case sensitive. So fuzzy find will look for matches of letters in a file path. Oh, in this case, there we go. As you can see here, if I do lowercase d, I don't know if you can tell the color difference here, but it's matching re and it's fuzzy finding. So it's not looking for an exact match. It's looking for a similar match. It finds re and then it does find a lowercase d. So it's still showing all of those. But the point is, it will allow you to search lots of files and folders very quickly by their name. So we use RG to be able to search by content, and we use FD or FZF to be able to search by name. So I'm going to hit Control C to get out of here, or maybe I can just hit Enter. Yeah, I can just hit Enter. Control C will cancel commands. It's one of the controls that you'll use very frequently. So this is how we kind of navigate around. We make files and folders, we remove them. There is one thing about removing directories that I want to show you. Let's go back here. rm-rf, commonly called rumruff, is a very useful but potentially very dangerous command. It will delete, this doesn't move to the trash bin, this deletes. It will delete a file or folder and all of the things that it has inside of it without asking any questions. So it's very important to be careful whenever you use rumruff, that is rm-rf. rm remove, dash rf, r is for recursive, f is for force. So if I want to delete a directory, I rumruff the directory, and it will delete the directory and everything that's in it. So if I look right now, dir1 and dir2 both have a readme.md inside of them. I run rough dir1, it completely disappears. It is not recoverable. If I did not have backups in place and I run rough something, it is very, very difficult to get it back. All right. In fact, on SSDs, it might not be quite possible. 
These, I would say, are the most common commands that you'll use in a terminal. Now, with that out of the way, there's a couple of other things I want to make mention of. Uh, we're going to get to aliases and fish versus bash real quick. And this should be enough to take us forward to tomorrow, which is when we are going to talk about using our development server again that we created yesterday. So, if you are typing long path names, which is quite common, so I'm going to do print working directory here. Let's say I want to list what is in this directory. I'm already in the directory, but for the sake of having this long path, we often have commands or paths that are very long and can span more than one line. So sometimes they can be difficult to read. If you want to move quickly, you can move character by character with the arrow keys. And I have my cursor set to run faster so that it doesn't take all day to get from one side of the screen to the other. But you can also use the Alt key with the arrow keys and it will skip by word. And this can make it much faster to, be get, to get to the beginning or the end of a line. So that's just a little productivity hack there. So we have talked about probably the most common commands that I use on a regular basis, as well as a little bit of navigation in the terminal. Now I want to make sure that you have a really great shell. Now that you've had, you have Webby installed, you can type Webby fish. And if you're on Mac, it'll go and try to do what it needs to do to set up fish as your shell. However, most likely it won't be able to do it fully automatically. So if you want to be able to get this type of, this is called a type ahead, and this the very nice history and type ahead that Fish provides, you can use Webby to install it. And then you can go to webinstall.dev slash fish. And there are instructions on what you need to do in Linux and on Mac and I think we might even have the Windows instructions here. No, we don't have the Windows instructions because we don't have this for Windows. So another episode that we'll be doing is on using the Windows subsystem for Linux so that you can have all of the same normal tools. Most of the tools that I've talked about tonight, you can install these on Windows just fine. If you go on webinstall.dev and you look for them, you can look at the homepage. So if I just go straight to webinstall.dev, not slash fish, or whatever, you can see that they're listed there. And if there is a button there to install them on Windows, then they should install on Windows. But not all of them do. So your default shell will most likely be Bash or ZSH. And these shells are OK, but they're not super friendly for being a developer and using the computer a lot. They kind of are bare bones, get what needs to get done, done. But they're not as fast and friendly. So if you hit, in, on Mac, the way to get to preferences in any application, whether it's Chrome or if it's your terminal or pretty much any app on the Mac, you hit Command, Comma, and that will bring up the preferences. You can also go into the menu, but I'm not actually sharing the menu here, so that's why I'm not showing you to go to the menu. But you can go into the menu and select preferences, but Command, Comma is a nice way to get there. And I'm using iTerm, which is also, you can install that from webinstall.dev slash iTerm, and I recommend that you do. So here, under, I believe it's Profiles, there is a Terminal tab. Now, oh, is that not the right one? Let me go back to General. Ah, under the General tab, and this is on the page for Fish, there is a place where you can set your default shell for the terminal. And the same is true with the Mac terminal, but the Mac terminal is missing a lot of features that iTerm has. So I don't go through how to set up the Mac default terminal. And the Windows terminals, both of them, don't really have a lot of easy configuration options. So I'm showing this on iTerm. But even in Windows, you can set your default shell. So I'm setting my default shell to a custom shell and then I'm giving it the path of fish. 
And then anytime I open up iTerm, instead of having bash, which is great for scripting, but not so great for using day to day, it comes up with fish. And so that's how I'm getting all of this nice coloring and type aheads and all of that. The difference between the two comes in, like I said, when we get to scripting, when, and scripting is like programming. So when you're doing loops and assigning variables and doing the types of tasks that typically you're trying to save so that you can repeat them over and over again, there's definitely cases where you might copy and paste something from the internet in fish and you get an error because like I said, everything that you're going to see online is specific towards the specific towards bash, which usually works in fish, but sometimes doesn't. In that case, you can type bash and then you go into your scripting shell and then you can paste those same commands. So if I, if I were to go back and find a command that I ran earlier, such as I want to get that echo one, if I can find it, it looks like it's a little too far up and it's no longer in my history because the history is specific to the shell that the command was being run in. So my fish history and my bash history, they're separate histories. But I'll go ahead and create this again. I'm gonna echo hello world, and I'm gonna put it into, is it temp, beyond code. And all shells, when you hit tab, will auto-complete for you. So if you hit tab tab, even in bash, it shows you things, but you'll notice it doesn't necessarily have nice coloring. Some bash setups do, but it's not as dynamic. It doesn't have as nice coloring. It doesn't have nice features to be able to tab through tables and search things or get type aheads quite as easily. In any case, I'm gonna go ahead and create this file again. And you can see it works the same in Bash as it does in Fish. Most of the things are the same. When it gets different, you'll know. And at that point, you're into scripting. So these are the kind of things that you're going to need to know in order to work on a server. And we talked about Vim in a previous episode. Vim is very important. It's a code editor. It's very different from something like Word because Word will format text with special characters, sometimes called smart quotes and smart dashes. And if you try to copy and paste something into Word or out of Word into a terminal or a program that's like Word, Google Docs, anything of that nature, it's not going to work most of the time. So you need to be using something like Vim or VS Code. And I recommend that you use Vim, even though VS Code, you'll hear that it's easier, people really love it, and it is, and it's great, and I recommend you get to it. But I recommend learning Vim first because it's a code editor that works everywhere that you'll ever wanna be. And in some cases, Vim is your only option. So that's a very important command, and we're going to have some more lessons on that later. Okay, so with that out of the way, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, which is common to almost every shell, is aliases. So an alias is oftentimes you'll find that you use certain commands in a very particular way over and over again. And you want to be able to not have to type out as much, as many of the flags. So we're gonna do a kind of a silly example, but with things that we already did today. So I'm gonna go into my config file for fish, which is home slash dot config slash fish slash config dot fish, a little redundant. <laughs> But that's the way that it is. I'm going to open up this file in Vim. And I've already got some stuff in here. I'm going to go to the end of the file and just make some empty space so that we're not cluttered up with the other stuff I have in there. We're going to type the keyword alias. And then I'm going to set RGI as a special command that is equal to RG-I. So now, once I have closed my terminal and opened it back up again, this won't take effect immediately, but once I close my, my terminal and open it back up again, or I open up a new tab in my terminal, I'll have what appears to be a command. It's actually an alias, 
but it appears to be a command called RGI, and it will behave exactly the same as RG-I. I'll also make an alias called Rumruff. Oops. And you guessed it, it'll be RM-RF. Now, this doesn't save me a lot of keystrokes or a lot of mental energy, but it's good for a demonstration. What you'll find is sometimes there are commands that have a long list of options, one of which is LSD, which is what I use for LS and LL and LA and tree. These are all commands to be able to list files in different ways. Tree lists them in tree form, which I'll actually show you that because that's quite useful. So I don't want to have to type out LSD space dash capital F capital A space dash dash tree every time that I want to run tree. I just want to have a simple command called tree. Likewise, I often want to be able to have a random password or a random token. And so I have a command here that will generate a random token and I just call it RND. So anytime I need a random password and I need a random token, I can just type RND and it runs that alias basically as a function and it gives me the result. So I'll, give, I'll use those as an example. There is, if I do command-v tree, this is the way to see where a command exists on your computer, you can see that it came back with nothing, meaning that command does not exist. But when I type tree, we can see that I get a beautiful output of my directory that mirrors the tree view and finder. And this is because of that alias that I just showed you. Likewise, when I type RND, I get back a nice long token that I can use part of it for a key or a password. And if, every time I run it, it's completely random, which is why it's called RND, because it's random. So these are the sort of things that are very useful to create as aliases and to collect over the years. These are the type of things that many people will create a gist with all their aliases. And when they set up a new computer, they'll go back to their gist or a code repository where they just keep some configuration files and they'll copy them from computer to computer so that they always have them. And this is something that you really should do is customize your experience. As you learn things, it's a great way to reinforce what you've learned. And it's a great way to save yourself a little bit of frustration from time to time. If there's a particular option that's long to type or set of options that are long to type for a command. So with that, we've covered the basics of what I wanted to cover tonight. I think these are some of the most important things that you can learn about working in a shell. So with that, I will leave you. If you found this useful, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Also, if you'd like to continue to follow these Beyond Code Live tutorials, you can do so with the links that are in the description to Beyond Code Live on YouTube and on Facebook. I try to keep an eye open, particularly on YouTube, for any questions or comments that come in. And I also try to keep an eye on Facebook and Twitch, but I'm not as good about that. So I'd appreciate it if you could join on YouTube when we do the live streams. And also, I do a little bit of a lifestyle channel, so every day I just kind of come up with a thought of something that I feel is valuable to share. If you want to follow that, it's Health, Wealth, and Commitment, and that's in the description as well. Thank you so much for joining. I would love to know what questions do you have about using the terminal or bash or fish. Please let me know in the comments below and I will do my best to get back to you. Also, you can contact me on Twitter it is underscore beyond code or via email, which is aj at beyondcode.com. I'll be happy to give you a short form answer there and then incorporate that material into the videos as well. All right. So with that, you have the best night ever and I will catch you later. Adios.